Hi everyone, uh, my name is Kristen Redman and I'm an associate professor here at San Jose State University's School of Information. And I'm so pleased to welcome everyone to our first uh, webcast of the 2016-2017 academic year. This is our first uh, webcast that is tied into uh, dimensions of diversity, which is uh, an issue that our diversity committee and several of the faculty are very committed to and uh, explore uh, in various ways here at the iSchool. So I'm really excited to uh, have uh, the opportunity to present Dr. Michelle Villagran, who will be presenting to us uh, over the next hour. I just want to welcome everyone, welcome Michelle, and thank everyone for attending today. Uh, Michelle, I'm going to go ahead and say a little bit about you. Uh, Dr. Villagran is based in the Los Angeles area and is a lecturer with the University of North Texas and works there as an LIS or Library Information Science Coordinator for the University of North Texas and their Master of Library and Information Science program. She also serves as President and CEO of Cultural Co, focusing in areas of cultural competency, competitive intelligence, and conflict resolution. She is a certified Level 1 and Level 2 Cultural Intelligence Facilitator through the Cultural Intelligence Center and Conflicts Dynamic Profile Consultant. Uh, she earned her undergraduate degree in Management and International Business from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and obtained an MLS degree in Legal Informatics from the University of North Texas. Uh, she also earned an MBA in Strategic Management from the University of North Texas. At Pepperdine University, she completed a certificate in dispute resolution, her master's of dispute resolution, and her doctorate of education in organizational leadership with her dissertation focusing on cultural intelligence in law firm libraries at Pepperdine Universities. So I am, feel we are so lucky to have her sharing her work and interests and knowledge, knowledge here uh, today with us. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and turn the mic over to Michelle. Thank you so much and welcome. Thank you, Kristen, and thank you also to San Jose State University for putting together this series. I think the topic of diversity and many concepts that fall under that are really critical, especially nowadays, and cultural intelligence is one of those concepts which falls under that umbrella. Well, let me give you my agenda first. Uh, Cultural intelligence is a topic I've studied since 2008. I've researched, done a lot of research on it. My dissertation was on the topic. Uh, I've also published and presented on this topic. So it's a topic that's really embedded in my own, um, my own life daily. And so I hope you'll pull a couple concepts from this that you can apply in your own organizations, whether you're uh, currently working in a library information center, if you're a teacher, um, Whatever your organization may be, I hope that you'll take some nugget away and be able to apply it. So what I want to look at first, cultural, culture matters. And what I mean by this is why is cultural intelligence needed? And really identify for yourself today a cultural challenge you may be facing. And then throughout the presentation, using that challenge to try to address uh, based on this concept, things you can do to really advance or even address or solve that cultural challenge. We'll also look at briefly seven cultural values, uh, as, and that we call them cultural value dimensions or orientations. And then we'll also look at how you can apply and improve your cultural intelligence. And last, I have a few slides about my research. Uh, I specifically looked at law firm librarians. So it's a very target group, but you might be interested in hearing what my findings were. So first, let's get started. So whether you are working across borders, and this may be in the context of international borders, you might have international students, you might have uh, international staff that work with you, or even patrons that come into your organization, or even closer at home, if we're thinking how diversity hits closer at home, to just bridging gaps between cultures domestically. 
also, and many of you may recognize uh, a lot of these logos, uh, whether you are dealing with the differences across various organizational cultures, so you might be working with stakeholders across offices, you might be interacting with patrons from various walks of life, you may bank with some of these entities, you may work with, as an example, Disney and their archives or the librarians over there. We deal with different cultures all of the time. And one culture I'm not going to go in depth on, but it's important to know about, are generations. Nowadays in the workplace, we have five generations that we are working with, five generations of patrons that are coming into the, our services, so it's important that we learn how we can bridge those generational gaps. That's why culture matters, and it really does matter how you effectively are utilizing your own intelligence related to culture. It matters, say, in how effective you are in negotiating a contract with a vendor or with a publisher. It matters, for example, in how you market or brand yourself, market or brand your library, uh, market or brand your resources that you're promoting, your programs. And ultimately, it can make the difference between whether you thrive in an intercultural situation or if you flounder. So it is all about change. I want to really emphasize that this concept, because now we're so fast moving and we're dealing with many different cultures, it's really a time of change. And I'll, I'll continually speak about change and adapting this and applying it to change throughout. So a little history on cultural intelligence, what it is. Some of you may have heard of this concept. Uh, it is a form of intelligence. We have our IQ, we have our SQ, our social intelligence, social quotient. We have an, an emotional intelligence, but we also have a level of cultural intelligence. And really the emphasis is on nurture more than nature. Uh, it integrates psychological as well as sociological issues. And it does draw upon the ability to reformulate one's concept of self as well as the concept of others. And you can integrate it into the other intelligences that I mentioned earlier. Now the great thing about cultural intelligence is that it can be applied to any cultural context. So if it's a diversity initiative you're trying to put in place, if it's an international management issue, um, maybe an organizational culture or subculture such as you're dealing with a specific gender, a specific generation, it can apply to any of these contexts. It also is malleable, meaning that it's flexible and anyone can improve their own cultural intelligence. And it is evidence-based. There's a lot of research out there. And I'll talk about the research uh, later on in the presentation. But it's been validated in the United States and in Singapore. And there are more and more individuals really studying this concept. So think about, and here you can see several things on this slide. People sometimes ask me, or you may even hear this, well, are cultural differences really that big of a deal? Isn't it mainly a matter of social skills and common sense? So to some degree, uh, some common sense and, of course, decent dose of social intelligence can help get us through the many uh, intercultural interactions we have. But where this topic becomes more relevant is when stress hits or time constraints or that pressure. And suddenly we no longer find ourselves amused by the idea that different cultures have different time orientations or different cultures uh, operate X and different cultures think this way. And simply knowing that some people are, say, more direct than others can help if we take the time to think about it and think about our own cultural intelligence. So mutual distrust. Before you know it, mutual distrust can possibly occur. Uh, for example, if you are in an organization that has, say, multiple branches or multiple locations, it's possible that the headquarter or central location may not trust, say, a regional or a branch office and vice versa. Or if you're dealing with teams, even virtual teams, nowadays we, we use technology like we're using today, and we have virtual teams all over. It's possible maybe you have staff in another country or even another domestic state or even city, I should say, and there may be a feeling of distrust between that team. 
The second one relates to conflict. And a lot of times this issue ties directly into managing conflict. There are times when we approach conflict differently. Uh, if you think about individuals that might be very direct, um, you might work with individuals that just sweep it under the rug or don't want to confront the issue. And maybe there's uh, even individuals where they use shame or honor. So this does occur even in the workplace and in our personal lives. The one under cultural intelligence is actually contracts. So if you think of uh, an encounter you may have had where it was a written contract or an agreement, say with a publisher or a vendor. And some cultures may hold very closely to what is actually written word for word on that contract, where other cultures simply believe it reflects what was agreed upon at that point in time. But remember, things change, as we all know. And then the fourth one, language and communication barriers. That I can't emphasize enough. Uh, that one is obvious. Uh, language and communication barriers will ensue. So that's why you need to know and utilize your cultural intelligence. And it is, again, at times when we're um, under stress or pressure and constraints, when we most need to survive and go into the cultural intelligence thrive mode. So here's the official definition. Uh, it actually was officially defined in 2003, so it is a pretty new concept. I'm going to read the definition and then give you a couple of more background information on the concept. So cultural intelligence is the capability to function effectively across various cultural contexts. And the thing I want to point out here is various cultural contexts. I think immediately a lot of us go straight to maybe ethnicity or maybe even generational, but we also have to think about national context, organizational context, even subcultures within our organization, because every organization has a culture and then there's subcultures. Maybe one department has a unique culture versus another department. So I just want to point that out, that cultural intelligence applies across various cultural contexts. Now, everyone has a cultural intelligence quotient, or CQ, and it's a score that you derive from actually taking an assessment and learning about your own cultural intelligence. And it includes four parts. So I'm going to go through each of the four uh, components or facets of cultural intelligence, and then you can see what you can apply to your own cultural challenge. It was developed as a concept to provide an overarching theoretical framework to tie together numerous models that are out there uh, and to turn into a valid way to measure the capability of cultural competence. So it's conceptualized as a multidimensional construct based on Robert Sternberg's integrative theoretical framework. And the dimensions really represent qualitatively different aspects of the overall capability to function and manage effectively in these culturally diverse situations. So here's the first uh, question I will pose to you. And if you are comfortable, I will ask in the chat window if you place the number 1 through 10 uh, in the chat window. Of course, this is voluntary. But on a scale of 1 to 10, so you might be 5, you might be 8, you might be 2, how would you rate your organization's effectiveness working across cultures? Now, one is non-existent, and then 10 is extremely effective. Now, I often get asked, uh, can I more fully define what I mean by working effectively across cultures? But I'm going to resist going there and defining it too much, because the goal really here is to get you thinking about, about this concept, what you know so far and observe some big differences possibly in participants on this webinar. And let's see what we come up with. So I'll give you a minute. If you're comfortable, you can place it in the chat. We'll see what numbers come up. I see a lot of six, seven, eight. I see a 10, seven and a half. So typically when I ask this, I usually get a lot of 7, 8 in that um, uh, area. Uh, I usually get one or two that say 10, and that's, those are the individuals I want to talk to, because it's very, 
where you're highly unlikely that the organization might be a 10. Um, sometimes I see, and I've asked librarians this over and over, I see some three, four, five, and those are organizations where they may have gone through a recent um, change. So it may have been a merger, a restructure, a downsize. Um, there's something that has really caused that individual when they're reading this question to think about, well, now we're in a whole state of flux and trying to become this new culture. So thank you for participating in that. And just think about that moving forward because the number might change as you think about how you can apply cultural intelligence. So cultural values. Uh, this slide often takes several hours to go through in workshops, so I'm going to try to break it down in about a couple minutes. There are seven cultural value orientations as defined and described by the Cultural Intelligence Center. Uh, their website is culturalq.com. I am certified through them, so I do a lot of work based on my certification with them. And they have uh, a nice breakdown looking at different geographic uh, clusters. So they really look at these orientations. There's seven different ones, so I'll go through each one with a few examples. The first one is individualism, collectivism. So this is the extent to which your personal identity, identity is defined in terms of individual or group characteristics. So if you think in your own workplace, um, there might be an individual that is motivated by a personal incentive or a goal, and they might be more comfortable with autonomy versus working on a team. Whereas on the flip side, if an individual comes from a collectivist uh, background, that individual is more motivated by group goals or long-term relationships, and who knows whom is very important. An example, um, in the United States, we actually are a uh, highly individualistic culture, whereas China, as an example, is uh, often known as the most collectivist culture. So think about this in terms of your teams you work with, because if you have, say, 99% are individualists, that could pose problems when you're trying to reach a, a goal together. And let me say right here that the website uh, where you can find more information on this is culturalq.com. And I'll put that in the window for all of you that want to retrieve more information. The second one is power distance. Power distance is the extent to which differences in power and status are expected and accepted. So if a person comes from a background of low power distance, this means that uh, formalities are foregone, titles aren't important, uh, he or she may find appropriate ways to challenge authority. And then on the flip side, if it's high power distance, high power distance individuals prefer the chain of command, and they're less likely to question authority. So you can immediately see here the implications for organizations as well, because if you have, again, if you have all high power distance, they're going to probably not ever challenge anything and just do what they're told and go with the chain of command. Or on the flip side, you might get a lot of resistance, especially when it comes to change. Uncertainty avoidance it relates to risk, so the extent to which risk is reduced or avoided through planning and guidelines. Uh, if you have low uncertainty avoidance, this means that you act first, then you collect information. Um, whereas high uncertainty avoidance are individuals that really appreciate explicit instructions, and they rely on those policy and procedures in place. And they might be uncomfortable with amb ambiguity or uncertainty. So think about when you're providing, if you supervise uh, library staff, if you're providing you know, instructions, or maybe there's a project and you're giving some uh, instruction or facilitating, you might want to consider, does this individual need, you know, step-by-step, -step, one, two, three, four, very explicit instructions and some policy, or is it an individual that can just take it, go, and then come back later with the results? Now, the fourth one is cooperative uh, and competitive. 
This refers to preference to accomplishing results. So someone who is cooperative believes the best way to accomplish results is by getting people to work together. So that group concept. Competitive are people are uh, more motivated by accomplishing results when there's a competition involved. So maybe some incentive where you're competing. But notice, I will mention, you could be both. And in any of these, you could be cooperative and competitive, just depending on the situation and circumstances. The next one relates to time. Uh, and this is the willingness to wait for success and results. So if it's a short time, uh, short term time orientation, individuals that have this cultural value want immediate outcomes more than long term benefits. And then long term are more focused upon the long term planning. And they might actually sacrifice short term outcomes for long term benefits. So that's a time factor. And I think that's critical to point out because especially I will say in the U.S. culture, we are very, very high on the, you know, quick turnaround, short term time orientation, where other cultures might not be that we're working with. Context is the extent to which communication is indirect or direct. So if it's a low context orientation value, say it's an individual, they really appreciate direct communication, they believe people should say what they mean and mean what they say. Whereas a high context uh, orientation, flip side, where the individual is actually paying attention to what, n what is not being said. Um, they might be focused on, uh, focusing on nonverbals, how you're dressed, reading between the lines. And this is one of the cultural differences that creates some of the largest points of conflict for many teams. Uh, and we see it often. And then the last one is being versus doing. And this is really uh, the extent to which you are being productive or you're deriving meaning from activity. So if you believe, based on your own cultural values and your background, that you are a high Maybe you rate yourself as a, uh, a more of a being individual. You work to live. You are always um, um, volunteering, whereas someone in a doing really lives to work. Same thing, but on the flip side, being individuals like to enjoy their life. Uh, an example, being cultures, uh, let me think, a few are like Latin American cultures, or even in the Middle East. So people are driven more by the quality of life than simply performance. But you can also find being oriented cultures in Western places. So if we think of like Nordic countries where people, we're giving people ample leave time and prioritizing recreation are actually high priorities. But if we think about home, let's come back to the United States where we're at, places like United States, uh, Japan, Germany are high doing cultures. So we are very focused on productivity and results. So you can immediately see again here how this can cause clashes within your own organization. So the question really behind all the research and one that really is going to inform today's session is this question. What's the difference between individuals and businesses that succeed in today's globalized multicultural world and those that fail. Now I want to point out the question is not who are the culturally sensitive because you can be culturally aware and still not be effective, um, nor is it who are the culturally aware because awareness simply isn't enough. Uh, instead, all of the research through the Cultural Intelligence Center and all of the research is out there is really interested in, in looking at what characteristics consistently emerge among those who can effectively move in, in and out of many diverse cultures. So that's where I'm going to head. And so let's talk about cultural intelligence more and I'll give you the model. Now I do want to point out some of you might be aware of other uh, tools and ratings that are out there, all very useful uh, as starting points and I recommend you can check them out. Um, so whether you're using, say, a cultural value ratings from 
Medical Intelligence Center, or uh, Hofstede, or Hofstede, I always say his name wrong, um, Globe Smart, Cultural Navigator. These are all different tools that can help with identifying um, your own personal cultural orientation and cultural norms. So it's a great starting point to know where you stand. And once you know where you're at, you can actually do group assessments and team assessments. But again, awareness is not enough. So even if, say, you take an assessment, then what, right? So we need to think about how do we actually adapt to these differences? How do we respect other preferences and still remain true to ourselves? Um, what can be done to actually train ourselves and others to be more effective working across cultures? So take a moment. This is my challenge to you and the one I want you to think through when we look at the, the model. Take a moment and think of one cultural challenge in your workplace. Now, I'm not going to have you share it. Um, this is just a personal reflection exercise we're going to go through as we go through the model. But I want you to keep this challenge in mind as we explore cultural intelligence. I will say, do not target a particular person or individual, but think more as a cultural uh, context. So maybe ethnic, uh, might be a national culture, might be a generational population. Um, homelessness is, is an example, homelessness population. So think of a challenge you have in your current workplace. And just keep that in mind. I'll give you a minute to think about it. And then we're going to go look at the model. Michelle, we had one that actually was raised in the chat box uh, just a second ago, right before you sort of asked everyone to, to think about this. And I'll just up. sort of, it like I'm, it's a few uh, messages up in the chat box if you want to take a look. It might uh, get you thinking about what the students and the participants are thinking about. Oh, this is great. This is actually um, Tim. He's one of my students. <laughs> Hi, Tim. Um, so he said, currently I'm a social worker for special needs population, which is a great example of a cultural group. Midlife career, uh, we're always made aware of different cultures that we're constantly working with. And we are trained to always take into consideration family cultures. That's critical when you're in a, a social worker environment. Not to discriminate, but to be constantly aware. Uh, promotes acceptance, understanding, training, understanding. This is great, Tim. Um, and this is one, actually, example that, that is working. It shows that you have the group, you know who you work with, your population, and maybe it doesn't present a cultural challenge because your organization is providing that support and has been training you and probably gives you regular support. There may be other organizations out there that possibly don't or maybe don't uh, provide enough support. A great example. Thank you for sharing. And thank you, Kristen, for pointing that out. Okay, so hopefully you have an example in mind. I'm going to go to the model because this will take it's four parts. So we have 30 minutes and I want to get it done. Um, this is the model. So there's four uh, facets or four components, drive, knowledge, strategy, action. Now the research does reveal that the culturally intelligent, so these are individuals who effectively accomplish their objectives regardless of the cultural context have strengths in all four areas, or all four uh, facets. And this is the model, again, I'm going to say, of the Cultural Intelligence Center. So it's just one of many models. Now this can be thought of as a four step, starting with drive. So today I'm going to go through the four steps. Uh, when you do learn your own cultural intelligence quotient, it includes these four areas. So you would learn where you're, you might have a weakness and where your strengths lie. We use all four, by the way, and all four can be uh, improved upon. So let's take a look at applying them. And I'm going to start with the first one, which is drive. So drive is your motivation. Uh, this is your interest. Uh, your confidence to adapt to a multicultural situation. And it's interesting because this one may seem like common sense, but it's often the most overlooked. Uh, and I think 
probably that's because, you know, we're required to go through some type of diversity training, um, but we miss seeing its relevance to making our job uh, more effective or what we can do to be more effective because it's like mandated we have to go to this training. And it might be one time a year, so that might impact our, you know, we go to the training, we're done, check box, next. Or someone might sit through a training before taking on maybe an overseas assignment. Maybe you're going to be relocating to another location. Um, but you might only appreciate the relevance of the training after you actually arrive in that other location. So it's important to intentionally address the issue of drive. And there are uh, three sub-dimensions. So let me share the sub-dimensions. The first is intrinsic, so this is where you derive enjoyment through a culturally diverse experience. So you're naturally interested, you are naturally energized, you like being faced with or encountering different cultures. Uh, now it's okay if you don't find yourself naturally energized by cross-cultural work or encountering different cultures, but consider how you could build your drive in this area. And one strategy I will give is to connect an existing interest with an intercultural component. So, for example, uh, maybe you like sports. So explore sports in a different culture, or maybe it's the arts. Well then, explore the arts in a different culture and learn more about that culture related to sports. So you're tying both your interests as well as an intercultural component. Now, extrinsic, that's the one in the middle with the little dangling carrot, this is gaining benefits from culturally diverse situations. Now, it doesn't have to be tangible, but a lot of times, you know, it might be a promotion, uh, maybe a new opportunity in your organization, um, but it also could be an extrinsic interest where a simple thank you, or maybe you get employee of the month. Uh, that is what we mean by extrinsic interest. So there's some benefit to, to that professionally. Now, if this might be an area of weakness. Um, you might make a list of tangible benefits you can obtain by doing, say, cultural, intercultural work or by being involved with that intercultural team. And think about it and what's important to you. And then maybe discuss it with your, your uh, supervisor. The last one relates to confidence. This is my cat. It looks just like my cat in the, the view there. Because while he's eight years old, um, he seems to think he's a big lion. Um, so he's very confident. But self-efficacy means having that confidence to be effective in those situations. Uh, sometimes even intercultural training focuses too much on mistakes people make. And we only hear those things. So it's really important to consider maybe there's a factor here where it comes to confidence or maybe uh, it's that delicate balance we'll say between a humble learner uh, but also somebody that might be afraid or doesn't know and hasn't asked that's where we reach out and we help support them so to develop that you can you know reach out to that individual that might be afraid or questioning what they're doing uh, and then also look back at your cultural challenge that you, you were thinking about earlier. To what degree are you motivated to actually work with and learn about that cultural group? How about others involved in the situation? So don't overlook that drive component. And you want to spend time reflecting on how you can improve in this area. Because it actually can cost it can cost you and it can cost others, reputation, et cetera, if you don't consider this, this uh, sub-dimension sub as well as overall this facet. Hands-on experience is a great way, just diving in and learning and immersing yourself, but also being able to face your own biases. So let me go to the second one, which relates to knowledge. Now this one, on all the assessments I've given, as well as when I ask this in person, interestingly, is always the weakest one of librarians. And I think that's because we are the type of profession we're in, especially if you're on the research side. There's just so much out there to simply 
research and learn. Um, and because I think we're also very genuine and humble ourselves that, you know, we, not, we might not be an expert in every single cultural group. There might be one area where we really are. And so this is your level of understanding about how cultures are similar and different. Those with high knowledge have a rich, well-organized understanding of culture and how it might affect not only themselves but others. Now let me show you this illustration. Many of you, and I see a comment lies of the iceberg theory. This is applied to many things in business, leadership, probably every industry or every area, but I'm going to apply it to culture. So people often resist learning about differences because they view it as being divisive. I mean, we've seen that, we hear that. Some will say, well, we should just focus on what we all have in common. We're all human, people are people, and only treat people as individuals. Well, that's really, you know, easier said than done. And can be unrealistic a lot of times. So this is where it's important to think about as a starting point how you effectively relate and work together. So at the very bottom, we'll start at the bottom, is your individual personality. So people usually focus on one extreme of the iceberg or the other in this illustration. Either we're all alike, which is the tip of the iceberg, or just get to know people as individuals, which is at the bottom. But the most important part is what's in the middle. We all have cultural values. We all have assumptions based on backgrounds or experiences. We all also have artifacts, systems. Um, think of your library logo, your library mission, uh, your systems in place. There are a lot of components in this middle piece, and this is where all the fuzzy stuff and conflicts and issues arise. So this is where you need to really focus on, on the knowledge side, learning about different norms, different values, setting aside your uh, assumptions, and really learning more about that particular group. And it looks like there's a comment, which is great, that uh, Liza uses this a lot with international students. And I think it's a great application, so I'm glad to hear that. Four sub-dimensions. Uh, I'm going to go to the next screen so I can go through a few of them. Now the first one tied to the other one, thinking about cultural systems, business systems, all types of factors when it comes to, uh, like, your legal system as an example. You know, it might be different in one country versus another. But if we're thinking about, whoop, I think I went too fast. Let me go back here. I didn't want to go that far, so let me go right here. Uh, if we're thinking about uh, interpersonal cultural values, that's what we talked about earlier, when we were talking about the value orientation. Now, in terms of sociolinguistics, this is where we are really thinking about and rating, not, maybe not rating, but this means understanding of another language or even grasping different uses of language, both verbal and nonverbal. And this largely relates to your ability to read and understand a language other than your own, but it can also refer to how you use that language in different cultures. Because the same word may mean different things, even in different regions, uh, with different dialects. So consider little things here when it comes to sociolinguistics. Uh, think about even how you write the date. Uh, changing the way you write the date for various contexts. That's something where a particular culture might write it one way, yet you write it another way. Um, think of the context, concept, excuse me, the context of, say, a specific event, um, Chinese New Year, or maybe a recent election or an upcoming election. Uh, it can demonstrate that possibly the way your views are or the way you're communicating might be different. What you believe and what you think about Chinese um, New Year might be different than someone else when you're communicating. And another simple one is in our email communication. How we address individuals within an email. Is it Mr. Doe or is it John Doe? So we've been thinking about how we address individuals. So we need to be careful also, say here, in social media and marketing our uh, library. Uh, a lot of times there could be a miscommunication. We might possibly offend a cultural group 
simply because of a particular word we used, uh, or it was actually interpreted incorrectly, but we were using it correctly. So the whole social media area is another area that, that can get a little sticky. And then leadership. Uh, many of you probably have heard of Warren Bennis. He's a, a well-known um, leadership guru out there, and he this is a quote of his. Quote, leadership is like beauty. It's hard to define, but you know it when you see it. And it's interesting because that quote actually has a double meaning. Uh, people often think they can trust their gut to spot leaders, but that can be really dangerous. On the other hand, beauty and leadership are in the eye of the beholder. So the leadership area is another area falls under knowledge, but it can open up much more context, especially looking at you know who your leadership is, and then if you're dealing with other organizations, say a vendor, and who is coming to the table to negotiate a contract, do they bring their say their sales boss and then another executive? And then who do you bring to the table to show up power, again, power from earlier, we're talking about power, as well as a leadership um, aspect. So you really need to learn uh, first your own culture and then about others. Uh, I always try to do this. When you're reading a document or an email, ask yourself, uh, ask yourself how is this shaped by culture? And very likely, we'll say probably 99%, very, very high that there's some cultural aspect within that document. So here's a fun one. I want to show this because um, it's one I use a lot and I think it's one that is worth talking about. This is an actual ad. Uh, Toyota ran this Prado ad in China. So the Prado is the vehicle. And they received extreme criticism for running this ad. It's a print ad. And I want to ask here, why do you think it received such intense backlash? So you can examine it. Um, and if you have any thoughts why, you can put them in the chat window. I'll give you some hints. It deals with, and it says right there, business, cultural systems, possibly um, religion, cultural symbols, uh, language. So I'll give you a minute to take a look at it. I see one comment already. Uh, Rachel said the statues. So yes, that's actually probably one of the, the most um, important ones when you look at this that immediately you see. And so these are two lions. Um, and lions are a powerful symbol in Chinese culture. They're often seen outside temples, uh, outside banks. And so in this ad, the Chinese perceived that one lion was bowing at the vehicle, and the other lion was saluting the vehicle. And so for a lion to be bowing to a Japanese car was very offensive to the Chinese. So great, yep, that's one, great guess. In the interest of time, I'll give you a couple others. So the tagline, um, on the left side, I'm not sure if any of you know what that says, so I will go ahead and read it. It is a um, Chinese tagline and it says, you must respect. So remember, this is a, an ad, a Japanese vehicle um, in a, an ad in a Chinese culture and we're telling um, the Chinese culture, you must respect this car. Another one. Does anybody know what bridge this is? It's a very important bridge. Um, the vehicle, the Prado, is on top of the Marco Polo Bridge, which is just outside Beijing. And it is the Chinese bridge with the most lions on it, number one. And number two, it was the site of the Japanese invasion in 1937. So clearly, you can see the whole gone wrong with this ad campaign. Uh, Toyota lost a lot of money. They weren't allowed to bring the Prado in for a long time. And I'm sure that this really impacted bottom line. 
also staff. Um, this is an extreme example, but it can happen just with a simple graphic or what might be used. So think about this even with your marketing, um, marketing your programs, whether it's an ad or a flyer, or even putting something on social media or on your website. So let me go to strategy now. And oh, comment, I wonder if the ad exec knew this was an issue. I don't know, but I'm sure there were some, um, maybe some firing going on after the issue. Clearly somebody did not do their research uh, and was not aware of all this cultural aspects, which is very unfortunate because it really impacted their, you know, their whole point of trying to sell this vehicle in another country. Now, strategy is just what it says. It is the strategy um, in how you, if you're aware, how mindful you are, you're able to plan for these cultural interactions. Um, I want to show you the sub-dimensions, because there's three. Planning is just what it says. It's planning. So maybe you are developing a hypothesis of what needs to change before you encounter that particular group. So if it's a homeless population, what would you change? Maybe you need to plan um, particular aspects. You need to maybe uh, think about the language you're going to use, think about how you're going to present that program. Um, performance reviews. This is actually a great thing I'll mention about performance reviews. An example could be thinking about how you're going to do a performance review differently if the individual comes from a different background. Uh, we always think, uh, I think, in the U.S. about eye contact. Well, if you're working with someone where I, they don't want to use eye contact, they just don't, that's their cultural norm. Or silence, where silence can be fine, um, depending on, you know, who's involved, what the situation is. Or silence could be used even as a conflict tactic. Um, where you need to really think about the situation before you come to a resolution. Awareness. So this is referring to what's going on internally and externally during the interaction. So it's observing, it's being aware of how you're feeling, what you're thinking. Is your planning working? Is what you thought really happening? Or are you winging it? You're going to have to change and modify as you go through the process. Or is the other individual behaving in a different way? Are they adapting to you or are you adapting to them? And a good way to develop awareness is really jotting down observations. So things that you can definitively see and observe. Not assumptions, but observations. And the last is checking, and I think sometimes we forget to do this, to debrief or check back in with our team, with ourselves. Spend time to really debrief on what happened, um, why it happened, if it happens again, how will we handle it. And so this is where it's really looking at those observations, seeing what the behaviors were, weird behaviors modified. I have a silly example, but it's a fun one before um, we go to the final dimension. There's this image or, or picture at the top. And if we had time, we'd go through that exercise. What do you actually observe and what do you interpret? Or what are you assuming here? Now this, I've gotten everything when I show this, um, this picture. So what we actually start jotting down, usually I hear things like there's five individuals, one has a knapsack, the person at the end is either uh, very confident or praying, um, the person looking down is like fearful or afraid. There's paper on the table. That's a woman. I get lots of variety here. But these are all interpretations. We're interpreting and we each have a different story. So we're each interpreting things differently and what the people are doing. We really, we're going to describe what we see. There are black lines on a piece of paper. I mean, we don't know the story behind it. And this is a fun um, exercise to do with your staff because then afterwards you debrief and you talk about the different uh, interpretations and why someone um, thought, you know, X of that particular individual, why someone thought the opposite. And it really helps in thinking about 
differences in the um, in the workplace. Now the last one, and this one's a quick one. Uh, this one relates to changing. Um, the first part is changing your verbal or nonverbal behavior, because uh, ultimately people will judge you based on how you behave. So we have to keep that in mind. So it might be, you know, how you speak, um, how you say no, uh, how you provide feedback, negative feedback. Um, do you provide compliments? When it's verbal, think about your rate of speech, your tone, uh, your volume, your level of enthusiasm. Nonverbals are a huge area. Facial expression, um, gestures, the way you dress. All of these aspects tie into the action piece. It's not just what's being said, it's also remember the nonverbal and what's not being said. So one of the crucial things to understand is we shouldn't always adapt our behavior. Um, sometimes it works, but sometimes we don't need to change our behavior. It's a matter of observing and learning about the other behavior and then spending time really reflecting on what was working or not working in that cultural situation. And this is where I always say practice new behaviors um, and adapt to how you give instruction, how you give feedback, how you, you know, foster interaction. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to show two last slides and we'll take any questions. Uh, my recommendation, if you want to learn more, you can always contact me and I can provide you with resources. So if you take an assessment, you know where you actually stand currently. Uh, and then you can reflect on it and develop your own plan. It all starts with each of us. And then we can work with our team or our whole organization. And making it a priority. You can take nuggets from today's session and just start adapting them. Think about your own motivation. And then say, hmm, why am I not really motivated to do X, Y, Z? Or is it the group I'm working with? Why? Or what can I do that I actually become motivated and want to be a part of, say, that rollout group that's going to be rolling out new um, software? And remember, it is all about change. We are constantly changing. That is a constant of life and especially in our library and information uh, centers daily, even with the patrons we're working with, so we have to always remember and keep that in mind. Now I'm going to show you one last slide, and then we'll take questions. So I did my research uh, for any of you that do have an interest on law firm librarians in the United States. And I was actually looking at whether, not just whether, they were culturally competent, but I was looking at their overall levels of cultural competence, but also if there are any variations among the four uh, facets of cultural intelligence, and then what viewpoints law firm librarians had about their value and the importance of cultural intelligence within a law firm. And these are my four conclusions. Uh, pretty much what I thought, with the exception of the last one, um, or no, the, the third one, because the third one went into a whole other separate area that wasn't really on target to what I was looking for. Uh, but the first one, there's a strong sense of value and importance in firms. There are also varying levels, which I expected. Uh, the third one, about feeling valued and appreciated, was kind of a tangent with my um, where I was hoping to go with my research. But it was really interesting because it opened doors to thinking about you know, are we valued and appreciated in our organizations? And what does that mean? And does culture have, uh, play a role in that? And then the last one, especially as I said, was so much change in our industries that law firm librarians are coping with the cultural challenges and have um, been adapting to unfamiliar environments because it's part of the job. They have to, otherwise they would be obsolete. So with that, I want to say thank you and see if we have questions. There's all my contact info, by the way. And um, Kristen, I'll turn it back no, to you. Thank you so much, Michelle. I wish we had more time for you to tell us more about your project. Uh, that would be wonderful uh, to hear more. Uh, I would, I certainly would be really excited uh, to hear more. And I felt like your, your presentation was so rich in terms of talking about this issue of 
cultural intelligence and cultural competency and different ways of uh, unpacking that. And what are the, I, I mean, why don't we open it up to questions? I have a few of my own, but I'm going to set those aside and see. I noticed a few hands were popping up and then maybe they <laughs> they didn't raise them anymore. But let, let me turn off my mic and see if we have any anyone that has any questions initially. Okay, so while everyone is mulling what you've presented over, uh, I was interested in, you know, you had mentioned that you, that that website had uh, some information there. Was that website also where that uh, CQ test was located? I, I didn't catch that, actually. So the CQ test, you have to, um, talk to a CQ certified facilitator. So if anybody is interested, you can contact me directly. Um, it is not free, I'll tell you that, but there are different um, prices depending on, you know, if you're in a government or nonprofit or academic. There are even tests for students, which is I, I've used for my um, some of my classes, and it's just fascinating to, to learn from the student side. I know, I actually give my students kind of an icebreaker that's related more toward uh, issues of diversity and how they manifest themselves just in different ways, both in the United States and in uh, just globally. And there's a lot of surprises in the, in the tests about, you know, just asking about different issues and what the student impressions were, and then they sort of provide a response to that. So I think that's really helpful. I think one that's just focused on cultural intelligence would be great for the students and just would have a slightly different angle to what we're already doing. So to me that sounds, I'd love to follow up uh, with that. Uh, one thing, and I know that you teach at University of North Texas, but you didn't say whether you teach online or not. And so I was wondering if you had anything to say about the challenges of uh, teaching online and this idea of serving diversity or just different uh, dimensions of culture in distributed spaces or online spaces, and if you could talk a little bit about that. Wow, that's a loaded uh, question. <laughs> oh, I, I didn't mean any harm. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm actually going to be uh, on a panel at Texas Library Association talking about multiculturalism and multi-pluralism uh, related to online um, teaching and I guess it's, that's an, next year in April, but it'll be interesting to see what comes out of that. And I do teach face-to-face um, -face as well as online, and I think in the online atmosphere there are more challenges just because, you know, you're not in person with the students. And even before we even go to, like, the class, um, I've learned that even looking at names, just because there's inherent bias and a lot of times we see a particular name, we may be quick to make a judgment about that person. We might assume they're, say, African American or they're Indian or whatever. And that is, I think, one thing that we need to step away from and separate that bias. And until we actually um, get to know the student, so if you have video or you really get to know them as far as their background. I always do like a introduction or tell me a little bit more about you and you share it with the whole class so there's at least some communication as far as background. Uh, and I think it's at least helpful in a smaller aspect. Um, but in the whole, like with technology, there's challenges. So that's a loaded question. Well, I, I, just, I, I, I really right just now. wanted to open up a, a dialogue about it because you want to, uh, present teaching materials and create a context that is really relevant to students and responsive to the different experiences that they bring to the classroom. And yet you can't really essentialize students based upon, like, as you mentioned, you can't essentialize them based on their name or who you think they are or what you think they bring to the table. And so how, how to create uh, a space for them to uh, voice, you know, what's relevant for them I think is so important and that's sort of how I sort of address it, but I, I'm always, I'm always like liking to hear new ideas. Well, and there's, um, 
I have a whole book of cultural exercises. Um, I've only in I think one online class used them, um, but it usually ties into a, an online icebreaker. Uh, and it was more, I think, receptive because I know in that class I had international students. Um, and it was a, a lower class, so they weren't at the very end of the program ready to get out and, you know, <laughs> move on. So it was one where they were really interested, and that became a lot of the interaction and discussion was built on what came out of um, that cultural exercise. So even icebreakers online. And there's a lot out there. I'd be happy to share the um, resource with everyone if you want to obtain the book. That sounds fantastic. Uh, Beth, Beth Renestis, who's also a faculty member at the iSchool, is here today, and she said that she mm -hmm. uses introduction videos. I don't know, Beth, do you have your mic today that you could just sort of describe what you're working on? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of working working without my headset, so I hope you can hear me. Um, I can hear you I, fine. I, I asked a couple, I, okay, good. I asked a couple semesters ago in several of my classes uh, a better way for everyone to get to know each other rather than just in writing through the discussion threads. And I found that the video um, allows everyone to see each other and hear the pronunciation of names. Um, I always ask for them to do a professional overview, like where do they work. And then I also say, tell us something about your background and your family. Uh, you know, there's no pressure if you don't want to, but we would love to kind of all get together. And that really has helped a lot with preconceived notions about people's names. Um, a couple, you know, semesters ago, uh, I came in thinking that someone was a man. Um, I mean, and it was woman, and I didn't understand that in, uh, it was a, a Pakistani uh, student, and I didn't understand enough about naming and spelling of different names within cultures, and so I made a very bad assumption. And so I really enjoyed the introduction videos in the online environment because it, it kind of, you know, it lets, it, it lets you connect like you would in a face-to-face -face classroom where you can actually see the individual. So I just thought that was one way to, to learn a little bit about someone um, ethnically and culturally uh, and then move forward and hoping that that's, you know, create some kind of communication vehicle um, among the other students in the class. That's great. And hi, Beth. I just read your comment. Tell Mark hello, too. Great to meet you again, virtually. I'm going to incorporate those videos. I think that's a great idea. I love that idea, too. Uh, and videos are so interesting uh, to have the students uh, create, you know, whether it's their shepherding readings from uh, the courses or they're talking about themselves. It can be really a really powerful medium. Uh, in an online class especially. Uh, one question I had about your uh, project with the law libraries was to what extent did you, I guess my question really is, did you ask the librarians that you worked with whether they had formalized professional development in uh, cultural competency or cultural intelligence or, did, or was that not one question that you asked? That was not one of the three research questions, but it did come out in, because I have a whole summary here, and actually did come out as far as the uh, valued and appreciated, which was not, you know, really where I was, I was not, I was looking at the important, really cultural intelligence, but that was a whole other area, and um, I did have in the results that librarians were saying because they were given professional development opportunities, um, not only, you know, raises and bonuses, but they felt that that contributed to seem, um, feeling appreciated in their law firm. So that was the only aspect where it came out. Other than I did ask about if they felt they needed more training, and I, I think it was a mixed bag on that one. I can't remember the exact results, but I do remember that some were, you know, they were good with whatever their firm was already providing, where others said they wanted more training, and it wasn't emphasized enough looking at cultural competency and, you know, working with clients and even internally their own attorneys. 
Yeah, and I mean, for, for us, one of the things that our, our committee does is survey faculty in terms of what, to what extent they're infusing their courses with uh, just different dimensions of diversity or cultural competency. And one of our surveys looked at cultural competency. And what I found, I did ask them to what extent have they had exposure to professional development in this area. And they didn't have, or, you know, the, as a group, they did not have a lot of preparation that was uh, specific to developing competencies in this area. But they had a lot of uh, sort of informal experience and informal knowledge. And I think that, so they had great dispositions toward cultural competency, but because they didn't have uh, formalized training like what you would provide, I think that when you mentioned early on in your presentation that dispositions are great until you're in this like high pressure context where the stakes are all of a sudden higher. And so how, you know, what do you have to rely on uh, in those moments uh, when, you know, like, like like you mentioned, when the when pressure is on and so how do you react? And so I don't know if the informal experiences and informal knowledge is as valuable as something that would be more uh, in like professional development, I guess is sort of my feeling. I think I would agree with you on that. Are there any other questions out there for Michelle? Okay, well, thank you again. I am so happy and appreciative of the time that you took to spend with us today. And I uh, we'll, would love to hear from you more uh, regarding what you're up to and your latest projects or even some of the resources you mentioned in session today that you'd be willing to share. I think everyone would benefit from those. I'd, I know I'd love to share them with my students. So thanks again, Michelle, and thank you to everyone who joined us uh, this afternoon. Uh, I hope everyone has a great week and that I will see you again maybe at our next uh, webcast, which should be in a few months or so. So thanks again, uh, Michelle, uh, and thanks everyone else. And thank you, Kristen and, and San Jose State and for all the attendees. And yes, please reach out if you have questions and I'll keep in touch and we can go from there. So thank you and have a great day.